Welcome, welcome to Sunday School. We are looking at the Christian worldview um, this morning. I want to give you just some categories to think through all of reality. And there's really three approaches for the Christian worldview. There's the redemptive historical approach, which you have in the handout before you. I'll pray in a moment. It's creation, fall, redemption, consummation. There's the personal salvation approach, which of course is problem, cause, remedy, means. It's going through what's the matter? How do things get made right? It's very individualistic. This one's more global and holistic. This one's certainly individualistic. And then another category is the one I'm calling the good life. And so um, I'm going to pray, but these are big fancy words. Don't worry too much about them. We're going to contrast the Christian worldview with contemporary worldviews on human nature and ethics and the good life. And how do you know what you know? And what is all reality? Those are just fancy words to give us categories. So let me pray. And then two verses from Matthew, one from Matthew and one from Titus. Let's pray. <clears throat> our Father and our God, we thank you for your great love with which you've loved us. Um, that even while we were yet enemies, uh, hostile to you, alienated from, from the life of God because of the ignorance that, that was in us through idolatry and, and unbelief, through loving creation, rather than adoring you and worshiping you, the Creator, that, that Christ died. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for your Spirit who leads and guides us into all truth. Lord, may you do that, not just so that we could leave here with knowledge, for knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. As we consider these things, may you foster within us a love for those who, who are in ignorance, who are blinded in unbelief, uh, that, that your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path might, might guide us in how we should walk wisely toward unbelievers and, and testify uh, to the truth that accords with godliness uh, for your glory and their good and our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So two verses. The great commandment. Remember, <laughs> what's the great commandment class? If you look in Matthew 22, and the Pharisees heard that Jesus silenced the Sadducees. This is Matthew 22, 34. They gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. So it's not a legitimate question. It's a question to try to test the Savior, to try to trap him. It's not even a genuine question. And you'll find often people will have questions to try to trap you in your Christian faith. And I think Christianity gives the very best example for, for the problem of evil. The best response, the best um, way that it deals with it. That is the smallest objection to the Christian faith. It is the most glorious response that we have as Christians. I touched on that last week. We'll get to that this week a little bit. But he's testing the Lord Jesus Christ. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And what you see there is a commandment for you to do what? To love God. Like wholeheartedly. Every aspect of your being. But your mind as well. And the mind throughout the history of the Christian church was given almost pride of place within our human nature. Body and soul were one, but the mind was given pride of place. What do you think is given pride of place today? Okay, inside personal reason, desire. Yeah, experience and feelings. Those are the most real, true aspects of who we are, really, in our culture. I'm not saying in the Christian worldview. But we're to love God with all of our mind. And then, of course, our heart and our hands. But if you look in Titus, this is a great, this is a great, a great verse. Um, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect, and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. And it says something about truth. What does it say? Truth accords with what? Godliness. I think that's... Now that seems very intellectual, doesn't it? Truth, knowledge, revelation, reception, learning. Just tell me what I need to know. And then godliness, the word really is, of course, piety. Which means how you live before God. 
And of course, Romans calls you to live as a living sacrifice. And you know what living sacrifices can do. What can they do? They can crawl right off the altar. And so the, the, the Romans passage is that you are presenting yourself as a living sacrifice. That you might know what is good, right, and true, the will of God. And you do that by the renewing of your mind. And the renewing of your mind happens as you are under the truth of God's revelation. So we're looking at big categories. And the goal is the renewal of mind, that you're a more faithful living sacrifice, and that as you're a living sacrifice, you understand um, God and all things in relation to God properly. I don't mean you become some amazing savant, but you can identify what's good and right and true, and then live in accordance with the grain of God's revelation. And often it'll lead to suffering and hardship. But let's look at the Christian worldview. Any comments or questions? <clears throat> let's just look at human nature real quick. So when you think of the Christian worldview, human nature is not necessarily a given. It's not a blank slate. Remember, with the modern expression of human nature, it's seen as a blank slate, isn't it? Just a blank slate. You can either you know, be formed in a good way or, or a bad way. Just like a neutral blank slate. I think the term was tabula rasa. Blank slate and autonomy. That's the common modern conception of human nature. Right? So autonomy, you know it comes from the Greek word... Um, well, it is a Greek word. Auto, namas, self-law. You are a law unto yourself and a blank slate and kind of what goes in comes out. Experience shapes you. Now, for human nature, according to scripture, what do we believe? Body and soul created in the image of God to worship, to love, and to pursue happiness. Sounds good so far, but then... Are we inclined in that direction? No. Right, there's something that's really happened that's terrible. It's called sin. It just it leads to disordered desires, but also what? The thing I know to do, I don't do. Right? The thing I don't want to do, I do. It leads to like a disordered will, and it leads to, of course, this um, the noetic effects of sin, which have to do with the noose or the mind, this, this suppression of truth and unrighteousness. And the judging of, of evil as good and good as evil, this, this, it's all, things are all off kilter. So it's not that you're just a blank slate. Now, the modern view of human nature is not that it's a blank slate. It's what? It's a social construction. In other words, you're going to be shaped based on your, your experience. It's a social construct, gender, like uh, your ideology, your sexual orientation. Those are just social constructs. It's very liquid. But let's look at the redemptive historical approach. Any comments or questions? Human nature is where I love to start. Always love to start. You have all these assumptions or assertions about human nature, and you say, well, how do you know that? That's an epistemology question. How do you know? Enlightenment rationalism would say by reason and judgment. Modern epistemology is social subjectivism. Everything's subjective and personal. Do you see the difference? To where the Christian epistemology is, there's a, there's a revelatory word of God that addresses us and tells us about reality and God and human nature and the good life. Go ahead, Larry. Explain human nature again. You said it was a, a matter of culture. Uh, I'm, I'm think, my question is, I'm thinking, as I think, I think here in this country, that's how the world wants to think. But it's not true. I was raised in another country under different circumstances, perhaps my thoughts would be completely different than they are here in this country. So I'm, I'm thinking where you are in the world and how you're raised has obvious, uh, obvious effects on how you think. Yeah, nature sure. I mean, our, our culture, our family upbringing, the different situations that we experience shape us about who we are, our desires or preferences. But the fundamental reality of human nature, when we talked about um, everyone's created in the image of God, right? Everybody loves. Everybody worships. Everybody pursues happiness. 
Like in a sense, those are, those are fundamental, I would say, truths almost without fail. All cultures, all people everywhere. That Certainly the image of God, people loving and worshiping is a given. Now, what they love and worship varies amazingly. They may, might not even call it worship, but everybody does. And what people define by pursuing happiness, maybe it's fitting in with the crowd in a certain culture and not shining yourself and humbly doing this and that. Maybe it's um, individual self-expression in our culture. But what, that's great, but what does Scripture say? So let's, let's go into our redemptive historical approach. You guys have heard of the redemptive historical approach. This is just my category for this approach. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation, or new creation. What does Christianity believe about creation or all of reality? Yeah, how did, how did we get here? Right, some worldviews would say, oh, it's, you know, Big Bang, uh, some sort of evolution. We believe supernatural, creation supernatural. Can someone turn on the AC? Is that, does that, anyone know how to do that? Um, the big debate over what we should set it at, right? What is this? <laughs> well, I'll leave that to your judgment, Teresa. <laughs> Creation is super, a supernatural gift. That's the, one of the most fundamental things of Christianity. Is the chair supernatural? No. <laughs> it's common. It's ordinary. Like Things tend to be made of um, form and matter. Right? What was this thing? It was a piece of wood. Does that make sense? And then someone had a, an, um, a vision to make it into a, like a lectern or a pulpit. And then to what end is it used? Well, it's used to hold notes so that God's people could be edified in the truth that accords with godliness. Do you see the end of it? It was like, let's make something to hold notes so that God's people could be edified. You see, it has an end. I think that's really important to grasp is that things have an end or a telos or a goal or orientation. And for Christianity, the orientation is found in looking at the nature of something. The, the matter was wood. That didn't have anything. And then, of course, who was the efficient cause? The carpenter who formed and shaped it, but with the mind of a particular end. And it's the same with creation. My kids, you know, they're wild. They like to stand on chairs at dinner sometimes, right? And I said, what are chairs for? What is a lectern for? What is a male for? What is a female for? What is a child for? What is marriage for? You see, creation has an inherent goal and tell us. It's not just a given. It has an end in mind. The way you interact or use creation or abuse creation or worship creation has everything to do with what you think the ends of your life are geared toward and what the end of that creational gift is given for. You follow that, class? I'm starting with ends. So creations, how did we get here? But within creation, there's a great goal. Remember the, the passage in um, 1 Corinthians. Whatever you do, whether you eat or whether you drink, do it to the glory of God. And so creation is meant to glorify God. And yet how you interact or relate to that, you'll do that well or you'll do that miserably. Any comments or questions? How did we get here? We could talk in two senses as it relates to creation. We can talk about creation in general. We can talk about the creation of humanity. And when we speak of the creation of humanity, it says that you're created in the image of God. And you're created really for two things. Remember the Westminster Shorter Catechism asked the question, what is the chief end of man? Do you see how those guys are utterly concerned with ends? Ends and goals. It's not just there's a givenness and then you decide what's best or what feels right or what works for you. There's an end or goal that's ingrained based on the revelation of God. And the chief end of man is really, it's twofold. It's to glorify God and what? And enjoy Him forever. And the glorify God and enjoyment certainly happens in this life. 
But their goal about the enjoying forever, do you know when that primarily takes place? New heavens and new earth. When you have the vision of Christ. When you're known as you see through a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Like the the face to face apprehension and beholding of the Savior is the great end of your existence, beloved. That's the ultimate satisfaction. That is the spiritual ecstasy. That's the great consummation. That is ultimately what you were created for. And in the meantime, you get glimpses of that, don't you? Like think of the great joys God has blessed you with. The comfort, the consolation, the encouragement, even the, the confrontation as you're out of line. And the, and the end goal is that you might be more Christ-like. And so when you think of creation, how did we get here? Remember, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And so when you look around this world, Christian, for your Christian worldview, creation, and, you, and there's a remainder, and you're not fully satisfied, and things are a little harried, and you're not quite in having that glorious communion experience with God that you had seven or eight years ago. You have to realize there's an enjoy forever aspect that is held out for you. That is your hope. And it's to cause you, you know, remember what Paul says in Corinthians? It's, it's, it's a crazy section. Let me find it. He says... <laughs> Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. But if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. And I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of the world is passing away. Like, it's a crazy passage. You're married, you're supposed to live as you're not married. Like, what's his point? His point, beloved, is the present form of the world is passing away. This is not all there is. Creation's great and it's glorious and there's gifts of God that you should be thankful for with almost all your soul. But the time is short. The day is, is at hand. The true light is already shining. The dawn of the new creation is broken free in your heart through the love of God in Christ Jesus through the gospel. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties, right? You think, what are the anxieties... What do they well up for? Are you anxious about the new creation and the the glorious vision of the risen and exalted Christ when he comes again to take you? I'm not anxious about that. I'm hopeful for that. What causes anxieties? This world, situations, circumstances. That's a great passage, and his point is the present form of the world's passing away. That doesn't mean creation's profane. It just means it's shot through with what, class? You could say sin, but then Ecclesiastes just says futility. Like as much as creation is good and glorious, there's an inherent futility in marriages, in work, in learning, in pleasure. What else does he name? Glory, right? I mean, he pursued it all. You want to find someone who had a good take on reality? Read Ecclesiastes. He knew the present form of the world was passing away. And so when it comes to the Christian worldview, we start with the creation. How did we get here? But my point was there's something so much more than creation. So don't get so bogged down in creation. Now, the way we get bogged down in creation, any comments or questions about creation? Making the goal that there's an end in sight, class. Don't forget that. That's one of the most fundamental things of your Christian worldview. There's a great sight spiritual and physical delight in seeing Christ when he's all in all.
Right now he's reigning in the midst of his enemies. Sin, <clears throat> death, our own deceptive hearts. Christ is reigning and soon he'll be reigning over his enemies. Like that is your hope, Christian. Fall. Let's talk about what went wrong, class. We have the redemptive historical approach. What went wrong? Well, something went wrong in the spiritual arena first. Turn to Ezekiel um, chapter 28. So it's a, it's a prophecy against the, the prince of Tyre, but this is a glimpse into ages ago with the fall of Lucifer. And it's found in verses 11 and following. It says a lament over the king of Tyre, but of course it's a picture of the fall of Satan. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, Raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You are the signet of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. So how does the king of Tyre get to eat in the garden of God? He doesn't. Okay, this is, this is a prophetic, mysterious insight into the fall of Satan. Every precious stone was your covering. Okay, now angels, what are they? They're spiritual beings. So when he's talking about precious stones, sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. Verse 14, you were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of stones of fire, you walk. So what's the picture of Satan? He's a guardian cherub, greater than the archangels, beauty, signet of perfection. He's great glory is given to him. He's one of the greatest angels. You were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. And then we get a little, you know, king of, king of Tyre, um, in the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God. I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, in the midst of the stones of fire, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground, right? He casts them down. So little lament for the king of Tyre, and yet also a great insight into what? The fall of Satan. <clears throat> Listen to this one as well. Isaiah 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground. You who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will, here it is. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to Sheol. So, what's the, what went wrong? <laughs> There's nothing inherently wrong with creation. There's a moral ethical problem that happens in the angelic realm. After the creation. You get the picture that this is after the creation. He's in the Garden of Eden. He's anointed cherub. He, in a sense, is leading the heavenly choir. You can deduce these things from Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. And he's corrupt. Satan becomes corrupt because of what? His pride. And his pride is wanting to ascend to be like the Most High, becoming equal with God. And you see, the way that he falls is the way that he tempts who? Go ahead. Adam and Eve. So the fall, what went wrong? <clears throat> I think one of the main things in Christianity for the Christian worldview, we have to acknowledge something went amazingly wrong. And the natural reason, at least before I was a Christian, was to think that there was something, some like ticking time bomb inherently corrupting creation to cause that to happen. 
that, well, there was some inherent evil in Satan or there was some inherent evil in Adam and Eve. Otherwise, how could this happen? And so based on that judgment, you have to do what to God? He has to take responsibility for that inherent evil and therefore he doesn't seem good. Because how could he allow it? Or if everything was very good, then how could this evil come about? Class, how do you understand evil coming about? Is it like, a, um, you know, something that just is ingrained in creation? Absolutely not. And we know it's not because after God makes everything in Genesis, he says he sees everything and it's what? It's very good. So everything he's made is very good. But of course, Adam and Eve, this is the key thing here. Adam and Eve... Angel, Lucifer and the angels are, um, yes, good, Barry. Mutable means able to change. They're free to act in accordance with their nature. God doesn't force people to obey. He doesn't make them disobey. Um, they act in accordance with their nature. And of course, Satan in his pride becomes proud and exalted and rebels and is cast down. So the first introduction of evil is in the spiritual realm among the angels. And the issue is the same issue that plagues us all the time. Remember Proverbs 3, 5? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Like even within that proverb, there's an inherent sense that we're going to think we're wiser than God. And in our pride, we're going to depend on our own hearts and our own reason and our own judgment rather than the revelation of God and to trust in that. You want to add something though, Larry? I was going to ask, is that the same as free will? A lot of people use the term free will. You're saying mutable. Yeah. Yeah, they're free moral agents. And the will is always free, class. It's always free according to its nature. That's one of the key things. Again, people will gnash their teeth at Calvinists or you Reformed Presbyterians because you guys are the frozen chosen. You don't believe in free will. We absolutely believe the will is free to act in accordance with its nature. And that's the important thing is the nature mutable. They're able to obey God or disobey God. Now once, of course, Adam and Eve sin, what are they able to do? They're not able to do any spiritual good. But what about the angels? So Lucifer was an angel, and the other angels were angels, but he was free to make a bad decision, and the other angels, you're saying, were free to make a good decision? Or? They're all free to make bad or good decisions. Absolutely. Now the whole issue is, well, can angels still fall right now? Right? That's... I would say no. It appears, I mean, this is just looking at it, <laughs> using clear examples of Scripture to speculate on things that aren't necessarily clear. And the sense for Adam and Eve, do you remember after they sinned and they were kicked out of the garden, what does God place in the garden? He place, places a cherub with the flaming sword going every which way guarding the tree of life, lest they, lest they eat it, right? And then be almost sealed forever in corruption. The, the tendency is in the garden with Adam and Eve, there, would, there was a probation where if they were faithful, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So let's say they didn't, and it's 2023. Is that tree still there like a probation maybe for you know, my three-year-old to go grab it and eat from it? The, the, the tendency is God wouldn't have left them hanging that long. There was a particular test and it was a test of whether they would be loyal to God that came in the form of Satan and his deception and his questioning the authority of God. And then if they would have passed that, they would have been confirmed in righteousness, eating the tree of life, and then not prone to fall. And so a lot of theologians look back on ancient history, and it says, um, speaking of the gospel, there's even things the angels long to look into. This is, this is almost pure speculation. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, what some of the medieval theologians said was that angels were given a glimpse, an aspect of foreknowledge, into the way that God was going to redeem sinners 
through the incarnate Son, who is, of course, the God-man. And, and the angels had all sorts of issues with that, that they would have to um, bow down and exalt and, and glorify a creature, the God-man, who is, of course, the true God. And this is pure speculation. This is like ancient medieval Roman Catholics. And so then they rebel. Satan has nothing to do with that. He wants to be like the Most High. You don't necessarily see that in Scripture. But what you see is that he becomes proud and exalted and lifted up and wants to become like the Most High. And that's what went wrong. That still goes wrong. And then the effect of that is what? Spiritual corruption, angels fallen, and then human corruption, human deception, human corruption. And so what's wrong, when you think of humanity in the image of God, I would love you to think in the categories of soul, of your intellect, your will, and your passions. And they're disordered. You have disordered desires. Who said that earlier? That was really good. Disordered desires. You have faulty perception and judgment of what is good and what is evil. If you think, um, we were looking at this in Hebrews. I'll just read it again for you. <clears throat> for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you. Basically, you become dull of hearing. You need someone to teach you the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But here it is. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have had their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Remember, we touched on this last week. How do you become mature? Constant practice. Good, evil. What's best? What's wisest? What's most faithful? Good and evil are before you. And then you discern, I'm going to choose the good. And then as you choose the good, what happens to your soul? You get a greater capacity to choose good by God's grace. It becomes easier to resist the evil. You become more discerning and more perceptive, and you become very mature. And the road to immaturity is the very first thing is you become dull of hearing. Right? You, need, you should be teachers, but you need someone to teach you, and they don't even listen. They're dull of hearing. And so when it comes to how can things be made right, you can't distinguish good from evil in the ultimate sense on your own, right? Because your desires, being corrupt as they are, you misidentify creation as ultimate. And you worship that, which is to make it profane. It's an illegitimate use of creation. And you have desires for all these things that may be well and good, but when they're, when they're ultimate, or even maybe you have desires for profane things. Who will deliver me from this body of death, right? You know, when God began to convert us, we realized, oh man, we're out of line. We got to turn. Oh, it's hard to turn. I have no power to turn. Oh, I need to be forgiven. And then the moment that, of course, God comes in His grace, you truly have power to obey and, and honor and glorify God. But the soul, the intellect judges improperly. Even if it judges properly in the fall, fallen state, what does the will do? It may still do the dirt, right? It may discern and judge the right thing and the good thing, but there's no power in the will to truly do it. And then the passions are leading you in all sorts of directions, lust and, and anger and malice and hatred. And so the fall is what went wrong, like a lot went wrong. The main point I wanted you to get for the Christian worldview is there's nothing inherent in creation. There was like a ticking time bomb of evil that God snuck in there. Free moral agents, Lucifer, Adam and Eve, willingly choose to sin because they're mutable, able to change. Being able to change is not a defect in nature. It's an attribute of moral beings. Go ahead, Barry. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure all of us early on, you know, when we were Calvinists, were like, God's utterly sovereign, and he's got a decree, and I just blew it. Well, he decreed it. You know, you can almost go insane, can't you? Like, it's, it's, and so what you have to do is just don't look at the decree. Remember, the secret things are for the Lord our God, but those things that he's revealed to us are for us and our children. So you look at the revelation, 
which tells you what? Fear the Lord. <laughs> and that means living under the Lord's authority. And the way that you do that is you believe what He's revealed and then you do what He's commanded. That's the best way to go about it. So we'll look at the redemption. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah, we're always mutable. So it's no wonder, it's no wonder that, as I think, we see the world just spiraling downward. They can only make choices according to their nature, which is already corrupt. So it just keeps getting corrupt. Yeah, I had a three-point sermon for today, and I was like, man, Lord have mercy on God's people. I need to make this thing two points because it was way too long. And I took out a whole part about Christ reigning in the midst of his enemies. And he rules his church by his word and spirit. But how does he rule the kings of the earth? Speaking of bad and corruption. Well, when you think of governments or people in general, they're, they're legitimate. God's instituted government, right? And they're common. They're not just for Christians. They're for all people. And yet, they're, they're what are they? They're provisional. They're temporary. <laughs> they're to govern in this age. And the most important thing is that they're accountable. They're accountable to God. And so when we talk about people fallen in sin, it's not that they have no clue about God or what God requires. God's ingrained that on their soul and their moral constitution with His law. His law is written on the heart. They have a sense of good. They have a sense of what's evil. They have a sense of right and wrong. Now, people will suppress that in unrighteousness, and there's a spectrum of just utterly wickedness and pagan virtue throughout the history of the church. And so it's not a given that things should just spiral from bad to worse. You bring up a good point, though. People are mutable, but there's a huge spectrum as it relates to people living up to the light of nature. And then those utterly just consciences being seared. And I think that's really important because as it relates to the Christian worldview, you have the categories to understand that. How is this person good? Oh, we know. Image of God. Sense of goodness, beauty, truth, a sense of right and wrong. People live up to that in amazing ways. Oh, that person's... T- well, we have a sense of that too. Like the conscience can be seared and suppressed. The truth is suppressed in unrighteousness. There's a moral ethical problem that relates to the life that God's revealed. It's not that God hasn't made it clear. That's the epistemology question, right? Right? How can you know all this? Pastor, you're so presumptuous. Like, who do you think you are? What's epistemology is just social subjectivism today. Social and subjective, personal, private, all decide right and wrong, good, right, true, and beautiful. As long as I'm not really hurting anyone, I mean, that's where the, the line's drawn ethically. But you're hurting yourself. That's what Scripture would say. Love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's a right way to love yourself. And the revelation of God tells you what that is. That's why, as I've touched on this the last couple weeks, God is love. Love is God. Right? And then what? Love is love. Love is hate. And so when you tell people, hey, the right way to love yourself is by not doing this, doing this, and doing that, and doing the other thing. Don't hate me. To love someone virtuously is to love them according to the, the, the will of God. And when you speak the truth in love, you can be seen as doing what to somebody? Hating them. Absolutely. That's really important to know that trajectory. And that has to do with an epistemology. How dare you tell me? And there's a right way to do it in love or maybe to bite your tongue because it's not the right time or you know, even, even if it is the right time to speak the truth you know, seasonably and graciously. But with epistemology, we're basing it based on um, really revelation. Class, it's not mysticism. It's not what you feel. It's not my faith says this. <laughs> Such so like a subjective. You see the subjective aspect to that? It's the revelation of what God's revealed for life to the full and flourishing. Go ahead. Within them, 
themselves. They can find scientifically or whatever methodology they use to find truth. But they, they have to, you know, we have to see that it's, and the thing is, it's absolute truth. It's truth. So it, 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 this is almost mind boggling that people go in all these subjective ways and, you know, try to do it themselves when it's, when there is an absolute truth that's presented to them to help them guide them and enlighten them and love. Yes, and we realize the absolute truth has to do with God and then living life to the full. I'm not going to find my wife's beautiful brownie recipe in here. right? There's a lot in creation that you're not going to learn about in here. But the key things about who, what is God like, how has he made you, what is life to the full, you nailed it. Revelation. External word. Not an internal word or internal feeling or, you know, good advice. <laughs> like, it's good news, a revelation of what God has done. And that leads to the redemption. How can things be made right again? And we know that things can only be made right again if God acts. That's the most fundamental thing that needs to happen. God has to act. And one of the ways that he acts isn't just to give you good advice. <clears throat> hey, clean your life up. Don't do this. Don't do that. May have you tried this? <clears throat> the problem is that we're spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. And yet, full of the world, <laughs> pursuing things that we perceive will give us life. You've all been there. Most of us have been there. And God has to break in. And he, he did that in the Lord Jesus Christ in your flesh and blood 2,000 years ago. Like, here I am. I've come to do your will. Like, you think of Isaiah 42. It's so beautiful. Like a bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. He won't cry out in the streets until he's established justice in the nations. Like, here am I, Lord. I've come to do your will. That's what he does. The will that you butchered and that you failed to do. And then he bears the punishment. He himself bore your sins in his body on the cross. That you might have an eternal reconciliation with God. And the way that you get that, how do you access that? You just trust that. You cast yourself on the Father's mercy and love towards you in the gospel. And that's hard to do because what you have to do is you have to look away from yourself and even from your sin or even look at your sin and see how big bad it is and then just bring it all to the Lord. That's just the main thing you need to figure out is, is the redemption. Things can be made right again because of God's love and because of God's action and because of the Christ of God who, who fulfills the gospel. That redemption meaning that you're no longer your own. That should be a great relief to you this morning. Don't you know that you're not your own? You were bought for a price. Like, that's a relief. It almost seems like a burden because you know what his next line is. Stop having sexual morality, right? Therefore, glorify your, the Lord with your, with your body and spirit, which are the Lord's. That's liberating. Like, that's freeing. That not only have you been redeemed and your sins are forgiven, but you belong to this God who loves you, who's embraced you, who will never ever let you go, who's begun a good work in you, and will carry it on to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Like I pray that's a great relief for you. Uh, any comments or questions about how things can be made right? Go ahead. Oh, that's so good. And it's overwhelming, too, if to think that every A, B, and C, that the, every, that the future of your life is at stake. It is to a degree. But you know, when we talk about the new creation, what is the final end or purpose? Hey, God's in no hurry, beloved. 
I would encourage you not to be in a hurry. Be patient as you endure trials. As God makes His will known in your life. As God sees you to and through things you couldn't even imagine. Things you would not want. Provides for you blessings that you needed just at the right time. Like God is in no hurry. He's glorifying Himself. And so may you trust that. Let me, let me close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank You for the revelation of Your Word. There's so much in Holy Scripture about what we're to believe about You and what You require of us. Lord, I pray You would humble us today. There is no evil within You. You do not do evil. You do not cause evil. You are good and faithful and true. A God of light and holiness and goodness. Thank You for the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of our sins, the reality that we're not our own. Oh Lord, may that give us hope in this life that we belong to You, body and soul, gifts, talents, abilities from Your hand for Your glory. Help us to glorify You today, for tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.